thank you very much. Um, I can't speak for my co-author, but I'm from Earth. Uh, that is to mean my background is looking at the Earth and looking at the earlier Earth and paleo, um, and I build model tools for looking at Earth and paleo questions primarily. Uh, it means that when looking at uh, exoplanets, the tools are well established, um, but they bring with them a lot of baggage of, of Earth-like assumptions. Um, and overall, this, this work is it's somewhat a work in progress um, as I try and apply tools really designed for Earth uh, to look at non-Earth-like situations. I sort of wish this um, wasn't a, uh, was a joke, but it's actually sort of my perspective of uh, at least how I uh, build the model tools. There's a rotating rock. It's got a bathtub of water that sloshes around, uh, and that's sort of the important bit for this talk and for a lot of sort of questions in, in, in past um, evolution of life in the ocean and biological cycles and things. Uh, unfortunately, there are no rubber ducks. These are actually smaller than the grid of the model, so they're not resolved well. Um, the duct really represents there is, at least on, on Earth, we, we don't have all water and there is like a very convenient amount of land that can weather, it can supply nutrients, it can supply cations, also things to the ocean that can fuel biology and can lead to um, things being deposited and, and lost to the system that, that are important. Um, I sort of concentrate on, and this is sort of like the thinking for the talk, is, is what goes on within the ocean. So we, we have some at least on Earth, on non-fully water-world planets, we have significant supply of, of nutrients um, to the ocean. Importantly, these are very heavily recycled today, and and through much of Earth's history, there is productivity at the at the ocean surface, new uptake of nutrients, fixation of carbon, material sinks with very with very <coughs> maybe varying efficiency through through Earth's history. Um, typically recycled very rapidly near the surface, and then material, a small fraction, maybe 5%, is, is reaching a number of kilometers of depths in, in today's ocean, maybe because the compounds are fairly recalcitrant, because the uh, material is, is part of aggregates that sink very quickly, or maybe there is some protection of, of compounds absorbed within, uh, within minerals in today's ocean. Ocean circulation on Earth and um, other planets will be very important because sustained over time, you know, even a very small fraction of nutrients and material reaching uh, the, the bottom of the ocean or on a planet will tend to then accumulate. And you need the nutrients back at the surface if you're, if you're to have a very vigorous um, cycle of, of, of biochemical cycling. Why does that matter? If you can bring in a lot of nutrients, you can lose nutrients. And if you can lose nutrients, you can lose carbon with the nutrients. And if you're losing carbon, effectively, you're releasing oxygen. So th like on the earlier Earth, perhaps mostly the, the burial of, of organic matte carbon drove the, the rise of oxygen and, and the great transition of uh, the oxidation of the, the Earth's surface. Um, the formation of ozone and then sort of potentially biosignatures from that. Uh, the, other, the other thing that a vigorous biological cycle in, in, the, in the ocean and on the Earth or, or any ocean can do for you, it can create significant heterogeneity in, for instance, redox. You have uh, the release of oxygen at the ocean surface. This can be released into the atmosphere. If you have a very vigorous biogeochemical cycle that consumes all the oxygen further down in the ocean interior, uh, you might produce hydrogen sulfide uh, dissolved in the water. You might produce methane once you're, if you have like a low sulfate ocean. There is the potential of, of these waters that are high in hydrogen sulfide or methane also to uh, be exposed to the atmosphere. So you can have the release both, both of oxygen and hydrogen sulfide or methane. So you can have species that really shouldn't be together being released to the atmosphere at the same time. And, and this could also provide uh, ways of uh, detecting life. Anyway, so uh, on a water-only world, you don't have the luxury of, of land and weathering and supply of, of fresh nutrients. There will be some sort of supply of dust, uh, micrometriates being ablated in, in, in the atmosphere. Uh, but this is pretty small on the Earth today compared with, with weathering. Um, 
you may have release of nutrients and substances from the ocean floor, from hydrothermal systems, but that's at the bottom of the ocean. You've got to get this back up to the surface. So, so really just saying on, a, on an ocean world, even more than, than today, it, it's critical that the ocean mixes pretty well. Either you want the materials released at the ocean floor to be efficiently moved to the surface so they're available to photosynthetic life. I would just say I'm here, I'm assuming for, for the purpose of, of thinking about uh, how productive a, a, a water world might be in terms of, of life. I'm thinking of photosynthetic life. Um, and if you have a very small flux of nutrients to the surface from space, you don't want this lost in the bottom of the ocean. Again, you want, you want an ocean circulation that, that moves things around quite, quite uh, nicely and efficiently. Um, so here's a question, well, how deep might the ocean on the water world be? I mean, we, we sort of think, um, the Earth sort of frames, I think, a lot of work in terms of, of ocean depth and the model tools. Um, the previous uh, talk was really interesting. This is a very common thing to have a to, to set up a model with a few kilometers of ocean depth. Um, I'm trying to think here a little bit more like, well, how deep might the ocean be, and what the, what are the consequences for much deeper than than a modern ocean? Um, sort of really thinking, uh, my motivation for the entire talk was just thinking, is, is, there, is, there, is there a depth of an ocean or the water world such that you wouldn't actually return material from the depth? So if you had a very small nutrient supply to the ocean surface and you lose a very small fraction, that's great depth, and you never return that, then you've got a really, very low productive biosphere. You have very little capability of, of um, burying organic matter, reducing that oxygen, making any sort of great spatial heterogeneity in things in the ocean and, and sort of your uh, ability to detect sort of uh, biosignatures may be very, very limited. So I'm gonna sort of consider re just really sort of uh, ocean depth uh, and then I can consider some other factors that might help control the circulation, uh, principally uh, energy at the surface and energy at the, at the ocean floor. The model is, it's, it's an Earth model, um, and there are caveats to that, and there are the issues with, with, with spin-up and the gener generality of, of the physics. Uh, this model is uh, run on a very low resolution just to start to explore the, the parameter space. The grid is only 18 by, um, uh, by 18 at the surface, and as I'll show, there are a variable number of layers. There are all sorts of modern Earth assumptions uh, entrained in this. It's just gonna be a normal ocean, you know, normal salty ocean. It's gonna be modern nutrients. You know, I'm really just considering a, uh, a modern Earth-like ocean, but covering the whole planetary surface. Um, but now, but just really just thinking about the variable depth of the ocean. Um, this is my favorite plot. Uh, because there's no bathymetry in this model. Uh, if there is on a, on a water world, what is the bathymetry? Do you have spreading ridges on a water world? Do you have like volcanic seamounts? Is it smooth at the bottom? You know, the answer could be anything you want. So this is gonna be uh, a smooth ocean bottom for the purpose of this talk. Um, this model also differs from uh, the one in the previous talk, CSM, in that this is very simply forced at the surface. I do not have a dynamical atmosphere, which, which saves me a lot of computational time. So it, it's having a zonal wind stress profile applied to drive ocean circulation. Uh, I'm almost also, also assuming a very, very simple uh, zonally average planetary albedo um, in the absence of a dynamical atmosphere in clouds. Uh, I'm running the model for, for 10,000 years. Uh, I'm spinning up from cold, which means that the ocean is, is starting at zero degrees, and we'll just see how it pans out after that. Um, so a typical uh, modern solar constant, modern uh, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere would, would have sea ice, that there is some sea ice at each pole uh, that spreads out a little bit, but, but um, a little bit like the zones today. Uh, so how deep should it be? Well, the mean depth of today's ocean is about 3.5 kilometers. If you're gonna take away all the cratons and make it a true water world, the average depth would only be about uh, 2.5 kilometers. Um, typically, in the, the modern model I use, the, the maximum depth is, is five kilometers with 16 levels. I'm gonna keep the layer structure so that I'm not changing the thickness of the surface layer where life lives. I'm basically just gonna add more and more layers uh, deeper down. 
And I'm going to test these different, not all have successfully run, but all these, these different uh, assumptions about ocean depth. So the 2.5 is just the water on today's ocean spread over a, a smooth billiard ball. There is a 3.5, which is the, the mean depth of today's ocean. Um, five, which is, which is a typical, reasonably deep bit of the ocean today. I'm going to just keep sort of adding levels 10, 15, 21. Uh, I've not yet successfully run 32 kilometer deep oceans, but it's, it's, a, it's a technical spin-up problem. Um, the max in the phase diagram, at least in this off Wikipedia, the phase diagram of, 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 of water in, in temperature and pressure space, you could, you could get to 100 kilometers or so before you start worrying about the water becoming ice. Uh, so I'm going to just pursue, just show you very briefly the initial results of some little ensemble experiments where I'm just testing the different configurations of the model, 2.5, 3.5, etc., kilometer ocean depth of a pure water world with otherwise modern like orbits and solar constant and, and density of the water and, and salinity, etc. Um, and in this grid of different CO2 forcings. So this is relative to pre-industrial. So times one is would be a, a climate like today. I'm going to do times four, times 16, and also make it a little bit colder. Um, so a little bit below the last glacial in terms of, at least in terms of greenhouse gas forcing. Uh, 100 milliwatts um, is the modern sort of mean geothermal heat input. So I've got a similar like factor of four each time. So 25 is, is getting close to, to nothing, uh, four times and 16 times the modern geothermal heat input. So really, I'm trying two different things. I'm going to try and heat or cool it from the surface. And I'm going to try different sort of heatings from the, from the ocean floor. And like I say, so far in these very initial experiments, because it's a, it's a modern Earth, um, Earth system model, um, and when trying a 32 kilometer ocean spin up, there are some uh, teething problems. So uh, there are going to be some plots where the computer is cheating at tic-tac-toe, and uh, not all the results are there. So this is the simplest case of just the water on the modern Earth redistributed over a billiard ball. Um, this is just a plot of uh, the sea ice extent, so there's, there's nothing uh, you wouldn't guess here at all. Uh, low CO2, there's more sea ice, high CO2, there's less sea ice. So I don't think there's a Nobel Prize in this. Um, there is some impact of this change of the geothermal. Andy, uh, can you uh, speed up a bit? Yep, I'm almost done. Um, there is, uh, now what was I going to say? There is uh, some effect of the, the geothermal heat input. So there's less sea ice as you go to uh, 16,000. Um, uh, milliwatts or uh, 1600 milliwatts. Uh, this is this is sort of the the sort of the sort of the most useful results so far. Uh, this is the the export production of these 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 different water worlds. Um, you had the highest export production in a in a planet or in a world where uh, you have a fairly cold forcing at the surface, but you have uh, high geothermal heat input. So it's really maybe not very surprising, but, but here we can start to quantify what sort of how much more biological productivity would you have in a world where you destabilize, you deliberately destabilize the ocean by having higher, higher heat input at the surface and lower um, uh, CO2 and uh, cooling at, at, the, at the surface. Uh, high, you know, heat input at depth, uh, cooling at the surface. Um, and the rest, really, they're not all spun up. The case, the, the, the game, really, is just to run through the different ensembles, different configurations, look at how the patterns change from one configuration of going to a deep and deeper ocean um, uh, to another. So they didn't all pan out, and the, the very deepest ones. Um, there are still some issues spinning up uh, uh, such a system. Um, so really, the, the thing I've, I've taken away uh, initially is, is just the, the thought maybe that younger planets, water worlds, might have uh, much higher productivity and much more potential for biosignatures in, in that the, the sun will tend to be, uh, have less output. So you might tend to have a, a, like a less, less heating at the surface, but you have more radioactive decay still in the, ocean, in the planetary interior 
to hit the, the bottom of the ocean. So you have a, a situation where you have much more vigorous circulation and much more cycling of, of what nutrient supply there is. And thereafter, your planet sort of ages, cools inside, the sun warms up, you tend to go progressively to a, to a, a less vigorous circulation and a, and a lower productivity and potential for biosignatures. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one very quick question. <coughs> uh, yeah, in the case where you have a lot of pressure there, where you have a, the rock and then you have the ice on top of it, but don't you have enough heat coming out of that rock that it would make either cracks or plumes through that ice and so therefore it wouldn't be a very effective barrier to the nutrients that you're trying to get up? So the, the ice was sea ice at the surface. So I, I don't have any ice at depth, so the, the, the depth of the ocean is not sufficient to have ice between the water and the rock and so far the equation of state is very very simple so I've, I've not progressed too far beyond taking a model developed really for the last few tens of millions of years to more generalized conditions on, on other worlds. Okay let's thank the speaker again.